Welcome back to the Free Mind Podcast, where we discuss philosophic and political ideas with adventurous disregard for intellectual trends. I'm Shiloh Brooks from the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado at Boulder. I'm joined today by Lucas Morell, John K. Boardman Jr. Professor of Politics and Head of the Politics Department at Washington and Lee University. Lucas is a trustee of the Supreme Court Historical Society, former president of the Abraham Lincoln Institute, and author of two books on Abraham Lincoln titled Lincoln's Sacred Effort and Lincoln and the American Founding. He's also written widely on the great novelist Ralph Ellison. Our discussion today encompasses the life and legacy of Frederick Douglass. We explore the political lessons Douglass teaches in his autobiographies, his thoughts on freedom, religion, and the American Constitution, and we consider how Douglass's reflections on slavery and race can enrich contemporary discussions of civil rights. Lucas Morell, welcome to the Free Mind Podcast. Thank you for the invite. I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about a great American, Frederick Douglass. And this is somebody that I've taught. And I know you've taught a lot. Um, and it's somebody who I, I think his relevance uh, uh, seems to never go away. And perhaps uh, he's more relevant now than ever. And so I thought we might start out by talking a little bit about who Douglas was for people who don't know. Uh, maybe you could outline what you think are some of his most important writings and then give us a sort of an account of why you think his books and speeches have endured so long and continue to do so. Great. No, those are fantastic questions. Um, he is a great American, uh, one of my heroes. Uh, my expertise, or at least my training in, in scholarship and teaching is focused on Abraham Lincoln. And you can't talk about Lincoln, at least during the Civil War, uh, without talking about Frederick Douglass, who was one of his uh, fans, but also fiercest critics, uh, because he was such a rock-ribbed abolitionist. So who is Frederick Douglass? Douglass was a man that was born about 10 years after Lincoln, 1818, 1819. We don't know because we don't have a birth certificate. Um, but he was born to a slave master and a slave mom, uh, the enslaved, as we say today and uh, didn't really get an up close and personal uh, experience with slavery until he was more in kind of the middle school teenage years. But he saw enough of it when he was little to know how horrible it was, even though he grew up in Maryland. I mean, it wasn't what we call the deep south and being sold down the river where things were really nasty. But essentially his claim to fame is that he escaped from slavery and uh, became world famous by publishing an autobiography called The Narrative of an American Slave, Frederick Douglass, uh, written by himself, as he writes uh, in the title. Uh, he became famous because here's an escaped slave that uh, writes the King's English. It's so eloquent, it's, and it's short. It's taught in pretty much all the colleges today. And he went on to write two more autobiographies, one in 1845, one in 1855, and then one in the 1880s that he revised a little bit. Uh, there's a book that was published a few years ago that says a fairly credible claim that he was probably the most photographed man in the United States of the 19th century. I mean, he lived in almost every decade of the 19th century, died in 1895. Um, and next to William Lloyd Garrison, which I think is, um, the, he was the most famous abolitionist in the United States. He was an editor of a newspaper called The Liberator that was published from 1831 until the 13th Amendment was ratified in December of 1865. He was a mentor of Frederick Douglass. When Frederick Douglass escaped with the help of uh, his wife, Anna, and when they made it up to Massachusetts and then eventually to Rochester, New York, he got onto the abolitionist or abolition circuit with William Lloyd Garrison and got to experience that, became an orator, and then an editor of his own newspaper, which uh, got him into some trouble with William Garrison because Garrison already had a newspaper. <laughs> but Gar Douglas said, look, you know, I'm an escaped slave. I'm black. Uh, I think I've got an insight on this that you might not have. And, you, you know, the, the world needs to know about this. Uh, they also got into a major squabble over the meaning of the Constitution uh, for the longest time. Frederick Douglass believed what Garrison believed, which was that it was a pro-slavery document. Then once he started reading some more and was prompted to read some more because he was editing his own newspaper called The North Star between 1847 and 1851, and then it became Frederick Douglass's newspaper, um, doing his own reading or at least a deeper dive, if you will, he was persuaded by guys like Lysander Spooner, Garrett Smith, a major benefactor of his, um, William Goodell, 
uh, and a few other folks, he became persuaded that actually, uh, as he put it in an 1852 speech, it leans towards freedom. Uh, it's a glorious liberty document. Actually, that's what he said in the 1852 speech. So that got him in trouble with William Lloyd Garrison because Garrison um, was not only an abolitionist, he was a pacifist. He was not what is known as um, a political abolitionist. Uh, he was a moral suasionist and Garrisonians did not believe that you could use earthly measures. In other words, the institutions of government, political parties, holding office, even laws. <laughs> he thought that you, you, you couldn't force bad people to do good things. And so they had to come under the conviction of God, the Holy Spirit, if you will. And all you could do is, is tell them what they were doing wrong. And you left the rest to God and the slaveholder to reform his ways. And Douglas held that view until about 1849, 50. And then uh, his most famous speech, uh, a lot of talk about that speech this year, was this one uh, that's titled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. Sometimes it's called, What to the Negro is the Fourth of July. And it's a speech he delivered on July 5th, 1852, where it's his first major speech where he essentially says that he believes the Constitution is pro-liberty, not pro-slavery. Now, I've been talking a long time here. Uh, do you want to remind me of some of the other questions or do you want me to just keep... Uh, no, no, that's quite here? good. That's quite good. I mean, I, I like very much... Um, the compressed account of his life that you give. And the, the reason I think this is so important. <laughs> yeah, right, right. The, well, the, the reason I think it's so important is, um, of course, he, as you mentioned, he wrote three autobiographies. And so one thing that strikes me about Douglas is that he, in a way, he, uh, sometimes various philosophers do this. Douglas seems to do it too. He points back to himself and oh, he, yeah. he, he seems to say, look at me, what I have to teach you is in me. Now, he, he expresses in the introduction to My Bondage, My Freedom, uh, some reticence about that. He's sort of bashful, thinks it's vain, and he wants to be clear that he doesn't, he's not trying to toot his own horn. He really does think um, that perhaps uh, the example of his life can teach something, but he's, yes. he's a modest man. Um, and so I, I thought what we might do is talk a little bit about the way he uses the story of his life to teach civic and political lessons. And this, this uh, is along the lines of the, of the question I, I have for you about why his speeches and books endure so long. There's something about his life, which even though, you know, it's uh, nearly, well, it's 200 years old at this point, you can read that book and you feel like you're living his life. He, yeah. He's able to make you feel like you live his life, even though there's so much time between the two. And so I'm curious both about this manner of teaching? And second, what we can learn from his life, given the fact that he wrote three, very odd uh, in a way, three autobiographies. Yeah, he's, a, as we like to say, a man in full, or, 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 or more to the point, was it Whitman who says, I contained multitudes? Well, he, he contained many multitudes, uh, three autobiographies worth. Um, here's a guy, of course, who has to make a living, and he's, and he's barely getting by um, on the stump by giving speeches and in fact, when he has to flee the country in 1845, because he names names in his autobiography, right? He is an outlaw under the United States of uh, government. There is a Fugitive Slave Act that will help states enforce their uh, fugitive slave uh, laws. And since he fled Maryland, even though he is physically free of his master, he is insecure in the eyes of the law. He does not have the equal protection of the law. Uh, in fact, according to the law, he is outside the law's protection. So he has to flee in 1845, um, a few months after his autobiography is published, uh, to the UK, to, to England. He goes to, to Scotland, Ireland, and, and, and uh, ends up in London, um, gives scores, of, if not hundreds of speeches for two years, until friends of his, both abroad and Garrison and a few other people back home, pay for his manumission. I think it was 150 uh, pounds sterling, which is over 700 bucks back then, a better exchange rate today. Uh, but uh, he would not pay one penny for his own life and liberty, he told people, but he had to explain why uh, he would accept manumission by the payment of others. But that's a more technical and, and kind of complicated uh, uh, discussion we'd have to have. But essentially, he's gone for two years and the way he's supporting himself uh, outside of just the largesse of his abolitionist friends on both sides of the pond is by giving speeches and selling copies of his autobiography. There's an Irish edition. It goes into a second edition while he's there. So when he comes back home, you know, you know, 10 years after the first one, now it's my bondage, my freedom. 
uh, is the second one in 1855, then one in the late 80s, uh, 1880s. Um, you know, it's part of his, his livelihood. But, but, but more importantly, there, I think there's two fundamental reasons why we can read Frederick Douglass with two S's, please, not one, as I tell my students. There's another Douglass I teach, Stephen Douglass, who actually was born with two S's uh, and then drops the second one, interestingly enough, around the 1850s. Hmm. At any rate, um, there's two reasons, I think, why Douglass resonates today with people, even though none of us are former slaves and none of us are enslaved people. Um, number one is the, the guy, as I said earlier, speaks and writes the King's English. Uh, it is a, he is a marvel in terms of the use, his mastery of the English language. He quotes Shakespeare more than Lincoln does, um, left, right, and center, in fact. Uh, and so partly as you just get caught up in the prose, he's a beautiful, lyrical, poetic uh, writer. Uh, and you get that not just in his autobiographies, but you get that in his speeches, which unfortunately are not as well uh, or widely taught. Most of the time people get Douglas in an English lit class or American lit class, and they're not going to be reading many speeches, if any, by Douglas. You read the autobiography, the first one, because it's really short and because he's awesome. Um, but you need to read speeches. The second reason, and I think a more important reason, is because he's a human being. It's the humanity of Frederick Douglass. He writes about his life in a way where he puts you in his shoes. And sometimes that's a pretty scary place to be because of the things he's experiencing, the things he's, he's observing as a, as, a, um, as a slave, as he recounts these things, of course. And of course, you know, everybody says you have to be suspicious of any autobiography. Um, would you write the unvarnished truth about your own life? <laughs> right? And so he was writing for a particular audience for a particular reason. So why he gives speeches. Every speech has a particular objective in mind. And it's, it's almost always a political one. Uh, but, but the humanity of Douglas. Now, here's a guy who actually believed all men are created equal. And he believed the words of the Declaration of Independence. He thought that those applied to him because it was a human being. His race, his former condition of servitude was um, a simply, um, a, a, well, his race is an arbitrary characteristic, and the other is, uh, was a, a product of, of, of forced fraud and, and legal in, uh, enforcement. And so what you learn by reading his, his autobiography, and I would say especially his speeches, you see a guy who is preaching what he has already practiced. And so when you see him emphasize character, when you see him emphasize um, the need for a permanent location, not pining away for some country that you, uh, as he would think, were supposed, he did not think that, that Blacks in America needed to find some African heritage to latch onto. He said there was plenty in their own American uh, past in heritage um, uh, for them to mine for identity. He thought uh, that pining for something else actually uh, keeps them in a paralyzed uh, uncertain state, and that would be uh, detrimental to their own uh, development individually, and civil and detrimental to uh, you know uh, promoting the civilization, uh, to use an old-fashioned term, of the race, given their uh, again their previous condition of servitude. So uh, the fact that he talks about himself as a human being and what the incentives and disincentives were as a slave and then as a free man to develop himself morally and intellectually. Those are the things that resonate with any human being. I mean, it, it probably comes as a shock to people when they read that uh, in his own autobiography, he says that the worst thing about slavery wasn't the physical uh, torments of it, uh, as bad as those were. Um, the worst thing about it is it denied the most fundamental part of who you are as a human being, and that is your, the, the, the development and the exercise of your mind, your reason. Um, and as soon as he saw that, that his legal master uh, did not want uh, his wife uh, to continue teaching uh, uh, Fred his, his letters and how to spell, and how to read, he recognized, ah, that's the key. That wh whatever master wants for me, I should do the opposite. And he just discovered that his freedom would depend on developing um, his mind. Uh, and so education was a key thing for him. Uh, and he was so frustrated when he became free and um, uh, tried to get people to subscribe to his newspaper, to sign up for the cause of abolition. He was, he was disappointed and uh, really frustrated with, with so many of the free uh, blacks that he ran into who were spending money, as he thought, on fripperies and, and extravagances and you know, joining the local lodge rather than supporting the cause. 
and in particular supporting um, their own ed uh, development as human beings in terms of educating themselves and making education a priority for their children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is very good. And, and uh, the emphasis that you place on uh, Douglas's humanity and the accessibility that we all have to his life is important. It, it occurs to me to say this about that, that Douglas, it seems to me, would disagree with a contemporary notion that uh, a person of a different race has no access to the experiences of, of someone who is not their race. In other words, Douglas seems to invite us in, black, white, or otherwise, and say, you, you can be me. I mean, you can't literally feel the pain that I felt when I was being beaten, but let me invite you into my life. There's something common between the two of us. Yes. Uh, I'm not a, uh, there's no wall between us. There's no inaccessibility here. Um, I'm a human being like you. And, and this seems to me uh, to come from two places, the, the education piece that you mentioned. In other words, he seems to think that education is, on the one hand, you could say, well, it's important uh, for, uh, in his view, in his time, an ignorant people to, be, to become educated. But more broadly, in the context of his discussions of freedom, he seems to think that freedom for blacks or whites or otherwise requires education simply because freedom requires that one be responsible. And in order to make responsible choices, one has to reason. And so he has this way of saying, look, you've got access to my life. You can become me in a certain sense. I can show you how I learned. And regardless of your condition, whether you're an enslaved person or a free person, black or white, uh, what I learned in my, you know, over the course of my life and certainly my time in slavery can benefit you and make you uh, a freer human being simply. Absolutely. He, um, I, I, I would sum it up uh, in the way that I did way earlier in our discussion by saying that he really did believe you know, that the, that first line of the second paragraph of the Declaration, all men are created equal, right? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Um, he really thought that that was true of human beings. Um, but, it, but you know, the strange thing, of course, or one of the strange things about being a human being is that we're born free, but we learn how we have to learn how to use it. It doesn't happen automatically, like with you know the brute creation, right? They just follow instinct. With man, they have uh, uh, they have choices that aren't automatically made for them, right? We don't just fight or flight. We make decisions, and we we talk about how to live, and especially how to live uh, in community. You know what what's true, what's good, what's beautiful, what's right, what's just. These are conversations uh, that outside of a Far Side cartoon don't happen among the animals, as far as we know. Uh, and so because human beings can decide whether they're going to live according to their um, capabilities morally, um, uh, soulfully, as, as Aristotle would say, um, this question of character is just so fundamental for Douglas. Um, he writes this speech, or uh, it's probably an editorial, early in about 1848, where he, he really lays in hard on the character question. Uh, because as long as, as Blacks are being discriminated against, and they are north of the Mason-Dixon line, there is no state in the United States where a Black is legally and civilly the absolute equal of the white man. And so as long as there are obstacles in America, and especially the obstacle of slavery, um, but just to focus on free Blacks for a second, uh, Douglas would run into Blacks that would say, well, look, no, there's this in the way, and I'm trying to find work, but it's all closed to me, and education, that, you know, they only educate whites, blah, 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 the, that, that so many of the Blacks in, in Douglas's day were using um, the obstacles that were palpable and were clearly there as reasons for not doing what they could with what agency, with what freedom, with what narrow band of, of uh, you know, uh, of area of improvement uh, that was available to them. And Douglas said, no, these you, you cannot use these as excuses. Yes, the obstacles that have been placed in our way by white people should be removed immediately, if not yesterday. Some are being removed, fantastic, let's keep that going. But we do not wait for them to be removed. We have to prepare ourselves so that when the court decisions come, so that when the laws are changed, we are ready to take advantage of those freedoms. And so for him, the fundamental thing to do that every individual, and that meant Blacks, since they're individuals too, uh, the fundamental priority had to be on developing your character. Uh, what was known at the time as education was never just a, a, a mind thing. It was also a heart thing. And that's what I mean by character, You know, the morals of a human being. He says, nobody can do this for you. Uh, no white man can do it for you because nobody can do it for the white man. He has to do it for himself. 
and you have to do it for for yourself. As he put it, you know, there's gold in the earth, but you got to dig for it. And you know, digging's work. <laughs> digging's hard. And so, he, he, you know, it, it it didn't surprise him, I guess, that that uh, many blacks at that time, like so many whites, weren't getting off their butts in 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 trying to do what they could with what little or much that they had. Uh, but he said, "There's no alternative. Th- this thing you must have to be a free and happy human being." And um, uh, yeah, he, he he never tired of exhorting them to that. And as I say, here's a guy who should know because he started with the worst circumstances. He started an enslaved human being. Um, this is a guy who found his freedom um, uh, uh, first by physically relocating himself. And then, of course, he needed to find it in the eyes of the law. But, but fundamentally, here was someone who recognized that to be free was something, as it were, that, that um, its development, at least, was something you had to give yourself. And that meant you had to develop, right? Honesty, industry, show up on time, work hard, learn. Here's a guy that once his, uh, uh, I guess, mistress or whatever you call the, you know, his legal master's wife, once she stopped teaching him how to read, he had some freedom in the the the, the city in, in Maryland to, to walk around the streets. And he would play games with the local white kids who loved playing with him. And he would uh, he would play games with them to try to get them to teach him letters on signs and newspapers, et cetera. So here was someone who had the the rudiment of of reading and spelling, and but didn't stop there and didn't use even enslavement as an excuse not to press ahead, not to learn, not to develop. Um, he he wanted to learn, wanted to read, wanted to develop, and uh, no obstacle was going to keep him from that. Yeah, yeah, and that that that's very good, and and I think for my students, oftentimes uh, the uh, his his recounting of how he learned to write and then can, you know teach himself to read based on the little bit that he he'd gotten from the the white mistress um, that moves them the most that he would just continue to fight with the grit and intellectual curiosity uh, of a free man, and I think what you say about the importance of character for Douglas, there are a couple episodes in the narrative that always strike me on this score. One is uh, perhaps not an episode, but just a, a, a general feature of the book. And that is that Douglas is very emphatic about the degrading character of slavery, not just for blacks, but for whites. Yeah. It degrades white people as much as it does black people. They are no, uh, they are not people of, of, of character. In fact, they're, they're arguably morally more debased uh, than, than, than the slaves. I mean, in his view, and, and the other thing is that he doesn't spare his fellow slaves from uh, moral critique. As I said, he says that the white man is, is as debased or more debased than any slave ever. But he says, we ourselves have to step up as well. And he gives this uh, wonderful example, which you'll remember immediately when I say it, because everyone uh, likes this part of the book, where he talks about the holidays and yeah. what would happen over the holidays. And for people who haven't read the book, Douglas says, well, there was this very clever mechanism, evil and clever mechanism that the masters would use to make the slaves thirst for slavery. And that is from the period of time from Christmas to New Year's, they would give them the week off from work and they would encourage them to drink and engage in the deepest dissipation possible, such that they would become as enslaved to rum as they were to their masters. In fact, so enslaved to rum and so made so miserable by it that they were eager at the end of that week to go back into uh, slavery. And they would even say, boy, if that's what freedom is, I don't even know if I want it because they would be sold in a way by their masters, a false bill of goods about the content of freedom. And what I think he's teaching there is that freedom is not simply about the pursuit of your appetites. When you say, when people say offhand, it's a free country, I can do what I want. Well, for Douglas, that's, you're still enslaved if you're merely pursuing your appetites, rum or sexual liaisons or money. Mm-hmm. That's not quite freedom yet. Um, and, and this comes out toward the end of the book when he says once he became a free man, he was very eager once he had married to pursue the duties and responsibilities of freedom. And that's a, that's a quote. He talks about freedom as something which is not simply free, but which is restrained insofar as there are duties and responsibilities that go along with it. And I think these three things all underscore your point about uh, character uh, as a part of the education for any free person, white or black. 
Yeah, I, I don't have much to add on that. That's was, that was very good. I mean, Aristotle's probably clapping in his grave right now. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, that's the thing. The, the kind of freedom that Douglas believed in, and I think generally the American founders believed in when we talk about the pursuit of happiness. It's not the pursuit of licentiousness. Uh, that's actually an enslaving thing. You become addicted to those things that you pursue in excess, in excess excuse me. And so uh, what Douglas is trying to do here is a very old fashioned uh, understanding of, 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 uh, of moral habituation, that it is something that is taught, but also has to be practiced in order to become a part of one's, uh, uh, not part of one's nature, your, your nature fits you for it, it equips you for it, it's a capacity that you have, but you have to develop it. But this requires moral effort. It, it requires the individual to impose limits upon himself. And I've got a great catchphrase for this. Self government. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, uh, you know, the founders thought you couldn't have self government at large. You can't have a community that imposes limits upon itself through constitution, the rule of law, right? Rota uh, you know, uh, regular uh, uh, elections, etc. that you can't expect public self government, public self limitation, self control, unless those individual selves are already habituated. Uh, uh, to control their own selves in their uh, private uh, lives. Um, so uh, Douglas, I mean, you, you, in a way you can't get more American than that. And that's pretty much uh, what Douglas is doing. He's preaching from America's own hymnals uh, back at Americans uh, and saying, and, and, but don't you know that these are human things, not white things. Uh, and therefore um, uh, black people need them just like any human being needs them. Yeah, yeah. And he, he really emphasizes, you know, you talk about self-government and things. I'm always struck by the way he emphasizes um, uh, his own self-emancipation. In other words, as you and I have spoken about, Douglas is unique in this sense. He rises from his own efforts. He, he is responsible for uh, his education uh, and for, for his mind, for his thinking. And, and, and one, one thing I want to discuss about this is, as I said to you uh, at the beginning, my sense is that Douglas has a, a civic lesson to teach contemporary readers, black and white, just as he was trying to, I suspect, teach a civic uh, lesson to those readers of his time. But if, if he teaches this profound lesson about freedom that you and I have discussed, and I think he very much does, and he's a, a genius for using his life as a vehicle for that, mm -hmm. one of the things that occurs to me as a potential obstacle is that um, Douglas's experience, the experience that produced this extraordinary human being, is not rec uh, it can't be replicated. It, you see, it's not something that we can all live through, other than by reading his autobiography. And so, I wonder the degree to which uh, the experience that Douglas goes through and the enlightenment he achieves about freedom, uh, whether uh, that experience uh, that he has is required to achieve that enlightenment. In other words, the regime can't replicate Frederick Douglass's experience in every single citizen. If it could, this country would be extraordinary. And so uh, what we are left with is the hope that uh, people can read and find sensible uh, what Douglass says. And I say these things only because I, I talk to my students, those who aren't uh, immigrants at any rate, and I say, look, freedom was simply given to you. You never took it into yourself. You never fought for it. You didn't emancipate yourself the way Douglas did. It's something that was given to you, and you've likely never subjected to self-conscious reflection. For Douglas, the reason his understanding of freedom is so profound is because it wasn't given to him, yeah. and he had to earn it. Yet the end point that we should all want to end up at, whether we're given freedom or whether we've got to earn it, is the end point that Douglas ended up at. And so I'm curious how a regime, and this is a kind of broad political theory question, I apologize for that, but how is a regime supposed to replicate in its citizens? And how would Douglas perhaps think it can replicate in its citizens the experience that he had uh, with respect to freedom, enlightenment, and citizenship? No, that's a great, and it's a, a fairly big question. Uh, all I could think of uh, during the first part of, of your remarks is thinking that, yeah, I mean, Douglas uh, in his autobiography, to be sure, um, exudes the zeal of a convert, right? <laughs> the person who most, uh, what is it that Emily Dickinson said, those who, who ne'er succeed to comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. What's the first line of that, that poem? <laughs> oh, it'll come to me later, but anyway. Point being that, yeah, the things that, that come to you in the most difficult way, the things that you have to earn, the things that you have to work for, those are the things you prize. Those are the things you hold on to. Those are the things that you guard and lock up and make sure nothing happens to. I mean, this is the problem with legacies, right? These kids who are born 
uh, with the silver spoon in their mouths and who don't have to lift a finger to get anything. Um, if they have very good parents, the parents don't let the, the, the kids inherit uh, or not inherit, but 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 uh, get a fortune before they die until late in their 20s or 30s. They don't want them to be, if you will, spoiled by the by riches. Um, you know, the old ancient prayer was uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that may riches be a blessing to me. In other words, for some people, riches are, are terrible. And you hear these stories about people who win the lottery and you very, you very seldom hear the stories of people who will win the lottery and everything goes just so well for them. Their children love them and they've got decent and honest friends of integrity. You just hear these horror stories of what happens to people who all of a sudden get a lot of money. That, that their lives are a disaster afterwards. Um, so anyway, uh, with Douglas, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want to replicate his no, no. among you know, 330 million Americans. Uh, that's a strange way to teach them freedom is to say, you gotta be enslaved first. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I mean, I mean, Aristotle taught these lessons uh, to people that were citizens, right? These are the, 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 the minority of, of the people in his, his cities in, in, in Greece were, um, we're, we're not enslaved, we're not in bondage, uh, but he said, no, this is what families need to do. This is, this is what parents have to do for their children in order for their children to exercise their freedom responsibly, for that freedom to be a uh, more of a boon than a bane to them. And so with Douglas, you have that essentially in all caps, writ large, underlined, bold, right? Um, uh, and now, and of course, you know, these autobiographies aren't just... Um, you know, they're not uh, McGuffey readers. These aren't just, you know, uh, primers on, on morals. He's actually trying to preach the evils of slavery. And again, as you put it, not just to the enslaved, but to the enslaver, right? It's very Socratic, the idea that the person who does evil, actually, uh, greater harm is done to him than the person who is the victim of evil. That's right. Now, that doesn't feel... <laughs> It's not very good when you're the one who's physically, um, I don't know why I'm laughing to keep from crying here. Um, when you're on the, the business end uh, of, of the stick there, that sounds all fine and dandy and ethereal and abstract, but boy, it sure hurts. It sure feels like I'm getting the worst of it. Booker T. Washington you know, preached the same message very controversially at the end of one of his speeches. It might be Democracy and Education, I'm, I'm forgetting right now, or The Educational Outlook on the South, maybe it's that one, where he concludes with this very harrowing paragraph about how Blacks can put up with you know, the, the, the ludicrous you know, white supremacy policies and practices of whites, but he feared for America's soul. And by that he means, the white American soul that he says, don't you realize what is happening to you by perpetuating this irrational color prejudice that, yes, you've been schooled in for over 200 years. We don't expect you to get over it right away. But you realize that the longer this continues and the more entrenched it gets, you think you're winning, but you're actually losing. You're losing your soul. Blacks might be mistreated physically. But look at what you white people are doing inside of yourselves. Oh, and you know, this is a black man in the 1880s, 1890s, who himself was born in slavery, uh, was freed uh, through uh, emancipation in the Civil War, and the 13th Amendment, most securely. Uh, and here he is, nearing the turn of the century, lecturing whites who have not known one jot or tittle of slavery about the character and quality of their own inner lives. And he comes out the better. He is the superior man because he recognizes that the harms that have been happening to blacks are in his mind, merely physical. I think we could say that that's a bit of a simplification because things happen psychologically, of course. Uh, but what he's pointing out is precisely what you mentioned that, that Douglas mentions um, very explicitly, very artfully and very strategically in the, in the narrative which is the damage that is done to the enslaver. I think one of the clearest cases of this is that mistress. Mm -hmm. She was an angel. The way he describes her, my goodness, it's beatific. Uh, but as soon as she finds out, whoa, because this is her first slave, you're not supposed to treat you know, little Fred this way. She becomes a demon to him. Uh, and of course, the point here is that, that evil is something that people aren't born with. It's something that happens. It's a corruption that takes over. You know, it takes time. Uh, and look at the corrupt, look at the corrupting taint 
that slavery has had on America. Look what it's doing to its religion. Look what it's doing to its politics. Look what it's doing, he would argue at that time, to its constitution. Um, it's a tar that we've just got to get rid of. Yeah, yeah, that's really wonderful. And for people who don't know, um, you know, there's this famous episode in the book where Douglas, um, there's a woman, uh, a mistress who approaches him very gently. And she's then told by her husband that you don't teach slaves how to read. This is precisely what will hold, uh, what will lead to them being unruly. Yeah. And she then becomes, uh, uh, she sort of has this insight and, and she begins to transform and uh, she was gentle toward him and then she becomes now abusive toward him. And Douglas says that this was the turning point in his entire uh, career, as it were, as a slave. He, he said, by my, my master telling my mistress not to teach me to read, well, I knew that there was something about reading uh, that I could find out that they didn't want me to know. And so far from making me not want to read, that made me want to read more than anything in the world. Yeah. Uh, and so, so uh, you can see this sort of reverse psychology um, at work. There's one more thing, or at least feature of the autobiography um, that I want to ask you about, and then I want to turn to Douglas's uh, broader legacy uh, in civil rights. Maybe we can return to Booker T. Washington. But one of the other salient features of, of the autobiography, the first autobiography, and now the second, I'm reading it in a reading group with uh, some students now, is that Douglas... In his criticism of whites, he talks about the hypocrisy of white Christianity. Yeah. And he says, um, this is a Christianity which justifies slavery, uses passages in the Bible to do so. They, they tell us to go to church, yet at the same time, Douglas says, I tried to start a, a prayer school, a Bible school, and it was broken up by uh, white men came into our little schoolhouse that we had on Sundays with sticks and beat us and told us, we couldn't do this anymore. And uh, at the same time that they expect us to be present uh, on Sundays at the services to sing, and they'll often quote to us passages from uh, the Old Testament about slavery and obey your Lord and these sorts of things. And so he comes off on the one hand as a critic of Christianity, yet at crucial points in his career, he says that he is convinced that it was the interference of God that permitted him to have uh, to learn to read, to have these insights, to go to Baltimore. He thinks just being taken off the plantation and becoming a city slave was, in a certain sense, divine intervention. That was really, you know. Um, and, but then there's this interesting appendix at the end of the narrative where he says, look, I've been criticized for my uh, own criticisms of Christianity, and I just want to set the record straight. Uh, Christianity has been perverted by the slave owners of the South, but the religion itself is good. And in a certain sense, I think he thinks it's required, it's necessary. Uh, and so I, I have this sort of theory, and I, I wonder what you would make of it, and that is just to say that Douglas C. is in a difficult position with respect to Christianity. He sees that it's being used um, to enslave. On the other hand, he's a man who, as we've talked about, is a uh, teacher of character. And he also sees that, well, Christianity can, when rightly uh, uh, approached and studied, be a great teacher of character. But it can also encourage meekness, and we don't want that. And so he's in between a rock and a hard place where he appreciates deeply the moral centrality of Christianity. Certainly whites and blacks are both Christian. There's some common ground here, uh, a, a common moral teaching. Yet at the same time, it can be misused to, uh, to inculcate a certain kind of meekness. And so he seems to be a defender of Christianity at the same time that he sees uh, its uglier side. And I'm just curious if you have any reflections on Douglas's own, uh, of course, as you mentioned in your introduction, he was involved with the Garrisonians, mm -hmm. um, on his own uh, religious quest and, and religious disposition. Yeah, um, I, I think you put it well when you, you brought up the, the, the idea of meekness, right? Um, uh, Jesus was known as being meek, but he wasn't someone you could push around either. <laughs> uh, and, and Douglas, if you read his editorials and speeches, um, he himself is a very masculine man. He's a large man. And he makes references to that in certain speeches in a very artful uh, and arch way. Um, uh, but there, there are many exhortations to manliness. Um, and um, uh, for women, there is a, in, in the same way that Aristotle says, there's a courage that females exhibit that's distinctive from the courage that males uh, exhibit. I think you see the same with, with, with Douglas when he talks about being manly and about, you know, he who would be free must strike the first blow. Well, that's not just for men, uh, but it is certainly for men, uh, given what um, 
uh, at the, and this is a guy, by the way, as you well know, he was an early adopter on the woman question. He is right. <laughs> absolutely categorically almost to a fault. And I'll give you an, ex an example for it in a second. He's almost uh, uh, to a fault, an early adopter of uh, not just the suffragette movement, but just women's rights. He was, uh, there was no more fervent believer of the, the, the principle of equality under the law, equality before the law than Frederick Douglass. And for him, uh, his own, the, the, the banner, uh, the masthead of um, his abolitionist newspaper, the North Star, was the, the, that, uh, that um, rights, uh, sex uh, was, was not to be a barrier uh, of rights either. And so why do I say that he, he believed in, in women's rights almost to a fault? Is that he uh, almost um, ostentatiously would parade around Rochester, New York, which is a northern city, but there's a bunch of racists up there. Um, you know, watch Gangs of New York. <laughs> You'll get some sense of what I mean here. Um, uh, Douglas uh, was very good friends with uh, these uh, uh, white abolitionist uh, sisters from England, the Griffiths. Uh, Julia Griffith uh, basically kept the North Star um, alive while Douglas was, was speechifying. He would walk around town with these, women's, with these women in arms, right? The fact that he's walking with a woman uh, at all let alone, uh, you know, elbow and elbow, right, uh, interlocked. I mean, Douglas, what, I mean, he, he couldn't even take a leisurely stroll without making a political statement, is my point. And so I think almost to a fault, he was trying to change public opinion, not just about his own equality as a human being, uh, where race should not matter, but also in trying to say that, yeah, and I can walk with a woman in public who's not my wife, and you shouldn't wonder about what's going on. Um, and in fact, by the way, Julia Griffith actually lived with him and Anna and their five children in Rochester. Uh, and so uh, there was tremendous speculation. At one point, Garrison pulled that card out when he got upset that Douglas disagreed with him about the Constitution, which we're going to get to in a second. So good grief. How did I get out to women's rights? Uh, oh, this whole masculine meekness thing that, yeah, I mean, Christianity, uh, like the Constitution, like government, like, you know, all good things. If you're a good Catholic or, or, or Protestant, you believe that. Um, especially if you're Catholic, uh, you believe that uh, the, the evils of this world are good things that have been corrupted. The, the evil doesn't exist in and of in itself per se, although the evil one does, but that, it, that it's a good thing gone bad. And so government is a good thing. It's ordained by God, but it can be misused. And that's what Douglas came to believe about the Constitution. Uh, similarly with religion, with Christianity, uh, that, that while there are parts in the Bible versus both in the Old and New Testament, that uh, the slaveholders drew upon as endorsements of slavery. Uh, uh, um, on the main, start to finish, uh, Douglas would say, no, that the Bible is, is the good book, it's the holy book, and um, you have to understand, if you will, uh, those passages regarding slavery in light of these more general, more obvious, and more sensible truths about the equality uh, of, of all men, right? Male and female, he, he, he made them both. Uh, that, that that all you know we're all God's children. Um, so yeah, Douglas. Yeah, in, in the end, he he is occupying a, a position that's uh, that that's in some tension. Um, you you have a faith, a Christian faith, that preaches that uh, that in the face of evil, you turn the other cheek. Well, woo. What does you know? What does that mean about? I mean, is, is that a, 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 a is that where defund the police comes from? Uh, or do we become pacifists like Garrisonians? Um, is the only thing we can do with regards to evil is to, at worst, raise our voice, but we cannot use physical compulsion, so no armies, right? So these are, these are, are, are serious questions, um, questions of, of theology and philosophy um, that I don't recall Douglas getting into any extensive, um, uh, or at least doing any public examination um, of, of these sorts of things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think either other than just teaching, as we've said, through through the autobiography, they, they do occur to me. And this this is a nice way for us to transition into our our next and, and final question uh, and, and component of the discussion. And that is religion will be will end up being uh, deeply bound up with the civil rights movement. Of course, Martin Luther King is a is a reverend. Uh, and so one one can conceive of Douglas as a certain kind of originator of wedding Christianity to the problem of civil rights. And of course, King carries that out some. And then the other thing with respect to his manliness, I would say, 
this is also bound up with King insofar as King counseled a certain kind of pacifist uh, turn the other cheek approach to, you know, when you go to a sit in, you sit there and the dogs bite you and the, the cameras are rolling and America will see it and the police hit you with their batons and you sit there. And so there's a, the, the, these themes that Douglas is on to. And of course, what Douglas does, uh, I very much like the way you mentioned his, his manliness. He beats up one of his masters, Covey, in uh, the narrative. He's sent to a notorious slave breaker. And at, at, at a certain point, Douglas fights this man yes. and, and beats him up and says, never again did he lay a hand on me. And he knew what would happen if he did. That is extraordinary. And my, you know, me and my students are just clapping, you know, whenever, whenever that, whenever that happens, I, King might, I don't know what King would have said to that, uh, but let, I want to give you a chance to, to talk about this because I want to transition into Douglas's legacy for an influence on civil rights, uh, certainly, uh, African-American political thought after him. Um, I want to read, uh, you mentioned Booker T. Washington. And so to kick this off and uh, I want to read a quotation from Booker T. Washington. Uh, but I, I'd like to discuss uh, certainly King and Malcolm X all the way up to contemporary uh, civil rights movement I issues. But here's a quote from Booker T. Washington that always moves me. Here, here he is. Even before I had learned to read books or newspapers, I remember hearing my mother and other colored people in our part of the country speak about Frederick Douglass's wonderful life and achievements. I heard so much about Douglass when I was a boy that one of the reasons why I wanted to go to school and learn to read was that I might read for myself what he had written and said. And so it occurs to me that you can draw a line straight from Douglas to Washington, and perhaps from these two to folks in the 60s, and perhaps from them, you know. And so I'm curious, what do you see as Douglas's uh, lasting legacy with respect to the question of civil rights, his influence on it? How might he agree and disagree with civil rights leaders, uh, both Washington and, and perhaps uh, Malcolm X and King, and uh, even civil rights uh, initiatives today? Yikes, that's a, a question that has many, many parts uh, in its answer and won't be able to tackle all of them. <laughs> I, will say, I mean, bringing Booker T. Washington, actually, even though I was the one who did it earlier, actually complicates things because Booker T. Washington was not an agitator. <laughs> right. Not a meek man, although he could fawn or, 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 or feign, sorry, meekness in front of, you know, white Northern benefactors like Dale Carnegie, among others. Um, he knew how to play the part and, and play the role uh, to keep Tuskegee Institute and many other um, were known as colored normal schools. These are schools that, that principally trained teachers, but also trained craftsmen and art craftsmen and artisans. And, you know, he was the one who hired the, the most famous black scientist uh, in, in America still today, I think, and that's George Washington Carver. The, the problem with Booker T. Washington, and by the way, Booker T. Washington didn't just read Douglas. He actually subsequently published his own biography of Frederick Douglass. And that one's hard to find. If you get if you find it on eBay, it's not $100. It's several hundred dollars for, for that one. Gee, I wonder why I know this. Um, and, and, and Ralph Ellison, a great uh, uh, writer, um, you know, author of Invisible Man, said that, that in writing the biography of Frederick Douglass, and I haven't read it, so I can't vouch for this, but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what Ellison said. Ellison said that Washington issued the coup de grace to Washington, in, uh, to, to Douglas in that biography. And by that, what, Fred, what uh, Ellison was saying is, Washington's the new man in town. And Washington's program is the program that needs to be pursued, not the more aggressive, in-your-face, rhetorical howitzer that you get from Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was at, lived at a time where the the... The primary objective had to be destruction. In other words, get rid of slavery. But now that slavery is gone, and this is Booker T. Washington, we don't need a Douglas per se. We don't need destroyers. We need builders. We need constructive things. And this was his way of attacking W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois was in your face. Du Bois was the one who wanted to agitate. He was the one who wanted to say to white this is what has to happen, and it has to happen now, legally, politically, civilly. We need our rights. We need our voting. And, uh, and, and Washington said, said, no, 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 no. That is imprudent right now. What the masses of Black people, the vast majority of whom live amongst former oppressors or the children of former oppressors, uh, they live in the South. It's primarily an agricultural economy. We have got to find a way to make ourselves useful to white people. 
And in time, the rights that we are owed today in time will come. So, so bringing in Washington actually complicates things. So let me make things a little bit easier by saying uh, Douglas's legacy, uh, I think fundamentally in the way that he could challenge our you know, kind of racial gridlock today in terms of how we think about these things, we're kind of stuck in our ruts, is by focusing on the Constitution. Douglas was asked one time, if you were president of the United States, what would be, you know, what would you be known for? And after Douglas stopped laughing, he said, equality under the law, equality under the law, that he was just rock, just rock solid on that. He said, the, one of the major problems um, with color prejudice in the United States, and for him, slavery wasn't the problem. Color prejudice was, if you get rid of color prejudice, slavery would go in America, he thought. He says, the problem is, the way we're going about civil rights and political rights is actually ending up reinforcing white supremacist mindset. In other words, the more we treat black people as if they were an exception to what we expect and what we believe, um, uh, well, well, we'll leave it at that. What we expect, the more we, we make blacks an exception in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of the community, to what we expect of everybody else. He says, the more we're actually reinforcing that there's something inferior about black people. And so he controversially would say, when people say, what should be done with the Negro? A ridiculous question. Nobody ever says, what should be done with white people? And so after Douglas cleared that up, he says, what should, we, what, what should be done with the Negro? As the locution went at the time, he says, do nothing. And he knew that would freak people out. Cause like, whoa, what do you mean do nothing? Well, what did he mean by do nothing? He meant, by do nothing, fair play, equal enforcement under the law. So if you see a black person going to the voting booth, stay out of his way. That's do nothing, which actually means protect him from racial intimidation of a mob, right? Uh, or some terror, domestic terrorist group. If you see him trying to learn a trade, stay, you know, do nothing, stay out of his way. If you see him trying to make a living, if you see him trying to get an education, so if you see him trying to vote, so his do nothing really meant do everything for him that you do for whites, that you believe is owed whites. Don't make an exception of him. And so he said color should not be the criterion of anybody's rights under the Constitution. And he said that the way we will get rid of the racial problem in this country is when we finally decide not to be charitable or benevolent towards blacks but to be just and fair to them. Don't make them an exception. Don't give or deny them anything you give or deny um, to, uh, that, that you don't give or deny to, to, to anybody else. And so that would be controversial today. You know, I always get the question, you, you probably get this if you teach his speeches, would he be in favor of affirmative action? Time to discuss this, but I don't think he would on the basis of, uh, of his notion of how principled and how categorical the protection of the law and the constitution should be for all Americans, regardless of race and regardless of sex. So as long, again, briefly stated, as long as you have affirmative action, which treats what we call today underrepresented minorities, right? Native Americans, uh, African Americans, and Hispanics, as long as you, as you treat them uh, in a policy with regards to education as if somehow they aren't able to measure up and work and do what they can to achieve the, the same way that we expect everybody else to. Um, and again, this is a, a complicated subject because you have to talk about, well, how you know, well prepared are they? And what about the schools that they're in? And what about funding? So we need, you know, we can get into the nitty gritty of that. But the bottom line for, for Douglas is it would pain him to know, I believe that in 2020, we still in the eyes of the law think that the constitution is not colorblind. We have never had five out of nine justices of the Supreme Court interpret the Constitution as if it was a colorblind Constitution. Yeah, that's that's a terrific insight, and and it leads me to what I want to ask you now in closing, which is uh, I'll recommend uh, a book, and you recommend uh, a reading. I, I recommend, of course, and I get the easy way out that if you all are interested in Frederick Douglass, you read uh, his first autobiography if that's the only thing you're going to read. Uh, although I'm reading the second one now, and it's it's beautiful. And Lucas, you are much more well versed in the speeches than I am, and certainly Douglas is writing on the Constitution. Could you recommend to our listeners, in addition, of course, to the autobiography, uh, some speeches that they might that they might look at? Yeah, number one, and I think if you talk to any of the experts, David Blight, Nicholas Bacola, you know, Peter Myers, Diana Schaub, 
if you ask me, I think his most famous and, and probably his most important speech is the one he delivered July 5th, 1852. What to the slave is the 4th of July? That was his, um, uh, his, his very public break from William Lloyd Garrison towards a belief that the Constitution was not pro-slavery, but pro-liberty, right? He called it a glorious liberty document. And it was an argument he would make in other speeches. You know, in 1857, his criticism of the Dred Scott speech, a very detailed critique of Garrisonianism with regards to the Constitution. Is the Constitution pro-slavery or anti-slavery, 1860? Uh, but because I'm a Lincoln guy, I have to mention the 1876 uh, April 14th speech that he gives on uh, the unveiling of the Freedmen's Memorial in Washington, D.C., the one that uh, they tried to tear down about a month or two ago. Uh, now, of course, the barriers and the fences are gone. It's amazing. The only sign that, that they were even going to try to pull it down is there's some orange paint on the back of the pedestal. I was there a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was nice to see that the barriers were down. But when that statue was uh, unveiled in 1876, he was the keynote uh, speaker. And in that speech, you see a, the, what you see conveyed by Douglas is the perspective on an assessment of Lincoln from the perspective of a died, uh, you know, die, I mean, just a, a, a diehard abolitionist. And that's Frederick Douglass, uh, who in the speech, although he says Lincoln was preeminently the white man's president, very controversial statement from uh, someone who admired, greatly admired Lincoln. He ultimately said, not viewed from the abolitionist perspective, right, where emancipation uh, was more important than preserving the union, if you will, uh, where, where from the perspective of the abolitionist, Lincoln seemed, you know, uh, cold, dull, uh, tardy and indifferent. He said from the perspective viewed from the perspective of a statesman, what Lincoln was bound to do is pay attention to a whole lot of white people as well, not just black people. He said his actions were swift, zealous radical and determined. And so it's a, it's a remarkable uh, almost confession by Frederick Douglass that had Lincoln followed Douglass's advice and made it an abolition war from the beginning, neither abolition nor the preservation of the union would have been accomplished. Uh, it's a marvelous speech. It's, it's a very sophisticated one. And I, for me, it's one of the top three or, or four speeches um, uh, that one must read. Well, Lucas Morrell, thank you so much for joining us today and discussing Frederick Douglass. Glad to be here. The Free Mind Podcast is produced by the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado at Boulder. You can email us feedback at freemind at colorado.edu or visit us online at colorado.edu slash